Good morning, welcome to our Good Friday service. If you're viewing for the very first time, my name is Timon Benson and I'm the senior pastor of City Reach Oakton. You know, Good Friday is a time to remember, to remember the suffering, the agony that Jesus went through in order to bring us to God. And it's our prayer this morning that as you watch, that you would feel the weight of all that Jesus did for you. Let me pray. Dear Father, we thank you so much for the sacrifice of Jesus. And Lord, help us to remember today all that he did for us on the cross. Amen. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. sinner condemned unclean how marvelous how wonderful in my song shall my 
Savior's love for me. One Peter two, verses twenty-two to twenty-five. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but now have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls.
The cross, the cross, an emblem of shame, only reserved for a wicked man's frame. The cross, the old rugged cross. The cross, the cross, no mercy deserved. Death was the price that the guilty one earned The cross The old rugged cross But when Jesus died on the cross of shame The emblem was changed by the power in his name the cross, the cross, the cross of Jesus Stained with his precious blood that redeems us The cross, the old rugged cross The cross, the cross of Jesus An emblem of shame but now grace and forgiveness The cross You know, for some, the cross is a fashion symbol. For others, it's just the symbol of Christianity, just something to put on a church. But for Christians themselves, the cross means hope. And you know, everyone needs hope. They need a reason to get up in the morning. And what the cross provides is it provides hope beyond the grave. Now, one of our members of our church is now going to share with us 
the hope that they have and the difference that the cross has made in their lives. Hi, my name's Anna and growing up I was the youngest of um, four girls and my parents and my sisters were all really high achievers. And so growing up I, I felt the weight of our family reputation, I guess, but it was also something that I felt that I could never really live up to. Um, on so many levels, I just felt like I was not enough, uh, whether that was academically or in my physical appearance because I was overweight or emotionally because I struggled with mental health issues. But it was also spiritually. Uh, my dad was a pastor and my sisters all came to personal faith in God when they were young, but I didn't. And, and so within myself, I felt this, uh, this pressure to believe but also like a failure because I didn't believe. And so I didn't really feel like I had a place in my family, uh, let alone in the world around me. And so how this worked out for me is that I uh, basically just tried to prove myself and um, prove my worth all the time in what I would do or say or what I could give to people. And the problem was is that I continued to find this feeling that I was just not enough. There was, there was no answer in myself to the question of worth that was plaguing me and I had to confront that this worth that I was looking and longing for I wasn't going to find in myself. And so if looking inward uh, didn't bring me the answer, you know, where else could I look? I started to look upward and um, I looked to Jesus Christ and I looked to the cross and what I found was actually that uh, you know, God knew, God knew that I wouldn't be able to be enough, in fact that I couldn't be enough and that was exactly why he sent Jesus to, to earth to live and, and die and to prove a worthiness before him that I just couldn't. In the Bible in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 it says that God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. So Christ took my unworthiness and he put it to death. And in exchange, he gave me his perfect worthiness before God. And so when he hung on the cross and he said, it is finished, he was saying, Anna, your efforts, your efforts to prove yourself are finished because I give you my perfect worth and my perfect efforts to put on for yourself. So I don't need to prove myself. I can trust Christ's worth and it is full and perfect. Every day I can still struggle to try and prove myself, whether it's to my family or to my friends or in my workplace. But what I find is, is that when I try to do that, I become frantic. Uh, I can be frantic to do or be something, whether that's thinner or more productive or even a better Christian or smarter somehow, I just become frantic. But when I can recognize I'm looking inward and redirect myself to look upward, then I find myself, instead of being frantic, I'm free. Um, you know, I'm free to be who God made me to be rather than uh, trying to be who I think I should be. Um, or I'm, I'm free to celebrate Christ's achievements rather than frantically trying to prove my own. And then I'm also just free to love God and to love others. Uh, and, and so trying to prove something to them or for them. In Hebrews 13 8 it says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever and because he's the same and he gives me his worth, uh, my worth is going to be the same regardless of what I do and so each and every day I can actually come to the cross and I can leave my imperfect efforts behind and instead I can look at his perfect worth that was proved on that cross and I can just rest I can rest in that and delight in that yesterday, today and forever. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope with no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains and My orphan heart was given a name My morning grew quiet and my fear rose 
was to dance when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace, so free, washes over me. You have made. everybody. Happy Friday, good Friday to all of you. What a, an ironic thing to be able to say in really. Have you ever thought about that, that we call this day Good Friday? When in reality, it was the single most horrible day in the history of the world. There is no incident has ever been more tragic and no future event will ever match it. No surprise attack, no political assassination, no financial collapse, and no military invasion, no act of terrorism, no act of slave trading, which we've had, no ethnic cleansing, no decade-long religious wars, nothing 
will eclipse the darkness of what we call Good Friday, not even a vile pandemic uh, that spreads throughout our community. No suffering has ever been so unfitting. I know that may sound hard to comprehend, but no human has ever been so unjustly treated. And again, that, that, that doesn't seem to ring true with all the abuse and harm we faced. And that's because we don't understand the worthiness and the majesty of who this Jesus is. Because no other human has ever been so worthy of praise as the Lord Jesus Christ is. No one else has ever lived without sin as our precious Lord Jesus Christ. No other human has ever been God himself in the flesh. And no horror surpasses what's transpired on that hill outside Jerusalem some 2,000 years ago. And yet we call it Good Friday. And we learn from this, this banner that sort of is over the top of this whole story is that what men have meant for evil, God meant for good. And this beautiful message that comes out of what we call Good Friday is that what men have meant for evil, God meant for good. And this banner, this truth can be over our lives too in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the truth. This is the banner that is over the top of every single one of you that have loved the Lord Jesus Christ and believed upon him. It was the single most horrible day in the history of the world. And no incident has ever been so tragic. For Jesus, this most horrible day dawned in Roman custody at the governor's headquarters. His own people had turned him over to this oppressive empire. The, the thread that held the Jewish nation together was the longing for this promised ruler in the line of their beloved King David to appear. And the prophets who had come before David and after David had pointed to an even greater king who would come, the Messiah. And yet when he finally came, his people, the very nation that actually organized their whole lives around waiting for him, this very nation did not see him whom they were waiting for. Much worse, they rejected their own Messiah. They crucified him. David had seen this propensity for human beings to worship themselves rather than worship the living God. He'd seen how people come against God's anointed. In Psalm chapter 2, in verses 1 and 2, we read this at the hand of David. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain, he said? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. David had felt the sting of those who betrayed him. He had been given a position by God and yet those people were sought to take that away from him. And yet this uh, beautiful psalm is prophetic as it points towards the Lord Jesus Christ. David's words had come true for his great descendant as Jesus' own people had turned on him and handed him over to the Romans. Judas wasn't the first person to plot against the Lord Jesus Christ. We learn that as we read the New Testament, it begins back in Matthew chapter 20 and reading on through chapter 22 is that the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders who felt very threatened by this man Jesus, were trying to entrap him with his words, asking him questions, hoping to trip him up hoping that they could embarrass him in front of the public and diminish his ever-growing popularity. But they could not. And so very quickly, they pulled the next card out of the pack, and that was that they plotted to kill him. And we see that beginning to happen in Matthew chapter 26. And Judas was the first domino to fall. Judas realised that there was money involved. Judas realised that he could make a bit of money out of handing the Lord Jesus Christ over. Must have been a terrible shock to the other disciples when they realised that the very one who would hand him over was part of their inner circle. The very one who dined at the table with the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet as we read Psalms and we read the book of Zechariah, chapter 11, 12 and 13, we find prophetically as God was speaking about this betrayal happening, that Judas would take 30 pieces of filthy silver, 
to portray the Lord Jesus. And we learn that that's the price of a slave. He gave away the anointed one, the holy one of God, over to the hands of the Romans. The Jewish leaders also were involved in this because Jesus wasn't on his own. He didn't act alone. Satan had filled their hearts and what Satan meant for evil, God had meant for good. And that's why we call it uh, Good Friday. But Judas was working in league with the Pharisees and the, Sar- Pharisees and the Sadducees, with the chief priests and the scribes. And we learn that he would hand them over. He would hand the Lord Jesus Christ over to them so that Jesus would be condemned and put to death all according to the foreknowledge and plan of God, as it turns out. The band of soldiers and their captains and the officers of the Jews arrested him and delivered him to Pilate. We learn about this in John chapter 18. And as Pilate would acknowledge to Jesus himself, he said, your own nation and chief priests have delivered you over to me. On the day God's chosen Messiah was grossly and unjustly executed, the human Agents of evil, those that were in control were gathered there together. All the the officers, all the chief priests and the scribes, all of those seeking to condemn the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was clear with Pilate who deserved more blame. He said to Pilate, he who delivered me over to you has the greatest sin. The very leaders of the nation who should have been pointing the people to welcome the Messiah and embrace him, were the very ones, because of their jealousy and their hatred and their fear, were the ones that handed him over to be executed. Even Pilate, when you think about it, Pilate could tell why the leaders had handed Jesus over to him. He perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. We see that in Mark chapter 15. They saw Jesus winning favour with the people and they quaked at the prospect of their own influence being eroded by him. Jesus' rise to renown posed such a threat to their fragile sense of authority. With an accompanying privileges that came along that, the liberal priests and the conservative scribes began to join together. Like politicians on both sides of the house They joined together to this common enemy that they perceived. But what they meant for evil, God meant for good. In the web of wickedness, guilty parties serve their roles. The Jewish leaders drove the plan. Uh, Judas served as a catalyst for that. And Pilate too had his own part to play, however passive that may have been. He would try to cleanse himself from the guilt of this by publicly washing his hands in front of everybody and saying he had no part to play in it. But eventually he would hand the Lord Jesus Christ over. He'd have him scourged and handed him over to be crucified. Because just like the Jews, like the scribes and like the Pharisees, he too wanted to retain his position. He too wanted to keep favour with the people above keeping favour with God. He too wanted the privileges that came with his position more than he wanted the favour of God. And so he succumbed to the temptation of self-worship. His heart was filled just like the scribes and Pharisees and just like Judas. And he gave the Lord Jesus Christ over to be executed. What man meant for evil, God meant for good. And this banner should be over our lives. There is not one day, there is not one loss, there is not one pain in our lives over which God cannot write good in Christ Jesus our Lord. Pilate tried to bargain. He offered to release a notorious criminal. But the people called his bluff and incited incited by the leaders and they called to release of of the guilty instead. Now, Pilate was concerned. He washed his hands as a show of that he didn't want to have any part of it. But he eventually released this wicked man, Barabbas. The people were in no doubt that this man was a sinner and he was guilty of the charges that he'd faced. But so incited by the wickedness of the Pharisees and Sadducees, the people would prefer him than the one who knew no sin, the Lord Jesus Christ. The rank and file... The people, the crowd, they played their part. 
They allowed themselves to be stirred up and they allowed themselves to call out for Jesus to be crucified in the place of a man that was already guilty. And they knew that. You can see this spoken about in Acts chapter 3, 13 and 50, where Peter speaking says, you delivered Jesus over and denied him in the presence of Pilate. And when he had decided to release him, but you denied the holy righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and you killed the author of life. What God, what the people had meant for wickedness, God had meant for good. And that's why we call this day Good Friday. Neither Herod nor the Romans are clean as well. In the end, in a surprising turn, um, Jews and Gentiles are working together to destroy and kill the author of life. They're like the opposition parties in Parliament working together, which we rarely ever see. But they had, as the Jews had, a common enemy. And tragically, that common enemy was the very author of life. We see our own evil in the midst of this too. We see our own evilness as we look at the blackness of this Friday in the light of the good news that we've received from God. We learn from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we delivered him over. We delivered him over. Christ died for our sins, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3. So we are as guilty as they are. We learn in Romans 4.25 that he was delivered up for our transgressions. Jesus died on that Good Friday. It was handed over for crucifixion. What man meant for evil, God meant for good. Galatians tells us in verse 4, chapter 1, he gave himself for our sins. We are as equally guilty. 1 Peter chapter 2 and 24, we learn he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. We meant for evil. What we meant for evil, God meant for good. God was at work through this whole episode of this Friday, doing his greatest good in the midst of the most horrible evil, over and in and beneath the spiraling evil of Judas and the Jewish leaders and Pilate and the people and all of us who have been forgiven of our sins. God's hand is steady, never to blame for evil, but ever working it out for our final good. As Peter would soon preach, Jesus was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. In the midst of what humanity was planning to use as something evil, we see the majestic hand of God working for the good of those who would love him. Isn't that, isn't that incredible? The, the majestic sovereign hand of God at work in, even in the midst of men's most wicked and dreadful moment of history. And as the early church Christians would pray, they prayed this prayer and you'll see it written out in Acts chapter 4 and verses 27 and 28. Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. They recognised that though these wicked men were given reign to work out the worst of their sin, God sovereign hand was at work as well to bring good out of their evil. God was at work on Good Friday, doing his greatest good in the moment when men were at their worst. Do you remember the story from Genesis chapter 50, if you, you may and you may not, of a man called Joseph who was taken by his brothers out of jealousy. They hated him as a younger brother and they threw him in a ditch and they finally sold him into slavery and assumed that he probably had died. And yet we learn as that story goes along and he ends up in Egypt and actually becomes a rescuer, not only of his own family, but indeed the whole nation of Israel. And we hear this beautiful banner, this beautiful saying that what men meant for evil, God meant for good. What men meant to, for destruction, God actually redeemed and was able to redeem the whole nation through that. And that, that banner should be over our lives because of Good Friday. That should be the banner that's over every part of our lives. What Satan, what the world, what our sinful hearts have meant for wickedness, God puts a banner over our lives and said, I can make those things good. I can make your life good. I can redeem those things. God puts this banner over the greatest tragedies of our lives. 
Romans chapter 8 and verse 32 says this, Since God himself did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not with him graciously give us all things for our everlasting good? Amen. God wrote good on the single worst day that this world has ever, ever seen. And there is not one day or one week or one month or one year or one lifetime of suffering, not one trauma, not one loss, not one pain, whether it's momentary or whether it's chronic, over which God cannot write good in Jesus Christ. He has redeemed us. He has saved us. He's made it good. Satan and sinful man meant that Friday for evil. But God meant it for good. And so we call it a good Friday. And I bid you good Friday and good morning. God bless you. The cross, the cross, an emblem of shame, only reserved for a wicked man's frame. The cross, the old rugged cross. The cross, the cross, no mercy deserved. Death was the price that the guilty one earned. The cross, the old rugged cross. But when Jesus died on the cross of shame, the emblem was changed by the power in his name. The cross, the cross, the cross of Jesus, stained with his precious blood that redeems us. The cross, the old rugged cross, the cross, the cross. Of Jesus, an emblem of shame, but now grace and forgiveness. The cross, the old rugged cross. The cross, the cross, where He took our place, saved us from wrath. Through His glorious grace, the cross, the old rugged cross, the cross, the cross of Jesus, stained with His precious blood that redeems us, the cross, the old rugged cross, the cross, the cross of Jesus, and emblem shame but not grace and forgiveness the cross the old rugged cross oh. the cross where death lost its sting the blood of the lamb covered all of our sin the cross the old rugged cross the cross the cross an emblem of hope cause Jesus who died he victoriously rose the cross, the old rugged cross, the cross, the cross of Jesus, stained with His precious blood that redeems us. The cross, the old rugged cross, the cross, the cross of Jesus, an emblem of shame, but now grace and forgiveness. The cross, the old rugged cross, the cross, the old rugged cross, the 
cross, the cross, I'll take up my own. I'll bear its reproach until he calls me home. The cross, the old rugged cross. Thank you so much for joining us on our Good Friday service. You know, as Jeff has said, it's an irony that it's called Good Friday, considering all that happened on that day 2,000 years ago. But our God is able to take the greatest good out of the worst things that happen in our lives. And the message of the cross is a message of hope and new life and forgiveness. And we just pray that you would have found that new life and forgiveness that is offered by God through Jesus this Good Friday. You know, if you want to get in contact with us, we'd love to receive an email from you. You can contact us at office at cityreach.com.au. But let me just pray to close our Good Friday service today. God, we thank you so much for all that you've done in Jesus. We thank you that we are now transformed and changed and it is finished. The work has been done so that we can know you, God, through Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, we hope you'll join us on Sunday for Resurrection Sunday, where we will be celebrating the resurrection of Jesus, 10 a.m. Sunday morning with Church Online. God bless you. We'll see you soon. The cross of Jesus, an emblem of shame, but now grace and forgiveness. The cross, the old rugged cross. The cross, the cross, where he took our place, saved us from right through his glorious grace the cross the old rugged cross the cross the cross of jesus stained with his precious blood that redeems us the cross the old rugged cross the cross the cross of jesus shame but now grace and forgiveness the cross the old rugged cross Death lost its sting. The blood of the Lamb covered all of our sin. The cross, the old rugged cross. The cross, the cross, the emblem of hope. Because Jesus, who died, he victoriously rose. Reproach until he calls me